Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Kenya Hunt's new book, Girl, 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 I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after over 93 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third-generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers and authors like Kenya, we wouldn't be here today, and we are so appreciative of it. So, tonight we are thrilled to have with us fashion director and writer Kenya Hunt for the launch of her essay collection, Girl, Girl, Girl. Kenya Hunt is the fashion director of Grazia UK. Her career spans working for some of the media world's most influential women's titles on both sides of the Atlantic. From her postgraduate days as an assistant editor at the seminal magazine Jane to her years as a deputy editor of Elle UK. Her writing has appeared in The Guardian, The Evening Standard, Vogue, and other publications. And she has made a number of appearances on BBC's Women's Hour, Sky News, and more. An American based in England, she lives south of the river in London with her husband and two sons. Joining Kenyan conversation is Abella Okobe. Abella is Facebook's public policy director for Africa, the Middle East, and Turkey. Prior to joining Facebook, she was Global Head of Human Rights at Yahoo in the Management Development Program in Nike's EMEA headquarters, a Senior Director of Advisory Services at Catalyst in Silicon Valley and Amsterdam, a Consumer Rights Policy Fellow at Consumers Union in San Francisco, and a Securities and Mergers and Acquisitions Lawyer at Davis, Polk and Wardwell in New York, Paris and London. She is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a board member of Junior Achievement Africa, trustee of CARE International UK, and has just joined the Board of Trustees of the Young Bit. She attended the University of Southern California, Columbia Law School, and HEC Paris. We will be doing an audience Q&A at the end of the event, so if you have any questions for Kenya or Abele and are watching via Crowdcast, Please drop your questions in the Ask a Question icon at the bottom of your screen. If you're watching via Facebook, please leave your question in a comment on the video. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kenya and Abele to the stage. Oh, so great to see everyone. Um, thank you for, for joining us for this virtual talk. Um, Abella and I are here in London where it's very late. We have our, you know, glasses of wine and water so we can like really- oh, it's not water, babe. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. We've got our glasses full of spirit. <laughs> exactly, exactly, spirit. Yes, to ease us into this discussion tonight, which, you know, I'm really looking forward to. So I thought we could uh, just start by reading excerpts from our essays, and then we can just get into discussing the book and um, our lives. And so, Abele, I'll, hold, I'll hand it over to you so you can kick us off. Uh, okay, I thought you were gonna go first. So, um, I'll, so my chapter is about um, motherhood and also about loss. So I'll read the first bit, which is about, um, about uh, the, the birth of my twin. So, my son was the firstborn of twins, twin A. When he was born, he weighed six pounds, nine ounces. He was smallish for a single birth, but he's a healthy size for an early twin. He had an enormous head beyond the 99th percentile, they told me. And in those early days, when everything about him was a complete mystery, a head bigger than the 99th percentile felt like a win. He had the most insistent cry, and he ate incessantly like he was in a hurry to grow up. Both of the twins had jaundice, so they slept under the glare of Billy Rubin lights until we were allowed to take them home. When they were five days old, we packed them up and went back to the hospital for a checkup. I handed the nurse my son and she said, what large hands he has. I bet he'll be a great football player. I knew she meant well, and maybe it was something she said to all the parents of baby boys. I couldn't quite trust my judgment in those early days of motherhood. 
I felt like I was swimming above ground, dazed and druggy from getting one night's worth of sleep over five nights. And I was almost violently hyper alert to potential threats. But I remember feeling in that moment that a story was already being written about my son, big in a country where stature is sufficient justification for murdering a black man. And how did my tiny newborn have big hands? And if he could, could he not use those hands to be a surgeon or a pianist? And that's when I knew I did not have the courage, the heart to raise a black son in America. America was built by black people on a foundation of blood and bones and appears to require a perpetual sacrifice of black children to stay alive. For black people, claiming America's home seems only possible in defiance, a bloody but unbowed, I'm still here, forever strangers in a strange land. That's it. Oh, thank you. Um, and then I will read uh, a few pages from a, a chapter, chapter 20 in the book called Bad Bitches. And um, it begins, the internet has several definitions for bad bitch. According to the Urban Dictionary, she is totally mentally gifted and usually fine as hell. An amusing, inspiring, fun-loving, and independent boss lady who is mentally gifted and also fine as hell. A female who knows what she wants and knows exactly how to get it. A female who is always ready for anything physically, emotionally, and also intellectually, one being book smart as well as street smart. One who is classy, all about business. Last but certainly not least, one who knows how to take care of her man at home and in the streets and remains loyal to him, herself, and the game at which she plays. That is just one of many entries, but the gist is clear. A bad bitch is a lot of things, probably too many things for one woman to live up to, but she is usually black. The phrase was popularized in hip hop and remains a mainstay in rap lyrics from Lil' Kim and Jay-Z to Lizzo and Cardi B, and always a woman. I love black women. I love us with a pure, bottomless, concentrated, no added ingredients kind of adoration that goes beyond the love I have for my mother, sister, aunts, or even myself. It's an enduring devotion rooted deeply in our stories. The winding, bendy journeys through small setbacks and enormous obstacles that make each of us who we are. The full lives that make each of us bad. Not bad meaning bad, but bad in the run DMC sense. Bad meaning good, better than good, excellent, goals, magic bad bitches. I love us. We are beautiful, powerful queens, master of slaves, leaders of movements, makers of culture, and changers of games. We are Michelle Obama's leadership, Grace Jones's radicalness, Maxine Waters' candor, and Tarana Burke's compassion. Yara Shahidi's optimism, Dina Asher Smith's speed, Serena Williams' stamina, and Sade's elegance. Ava DuVernay's vision, Patrice Cullors' activism, Missy Elliott's innovation and Megan Thee Stallion's needs. We are all these things and more. But in the course of writing this book and contemplating my own experiences, it dawned on me that as we celebrate our heightened visibility in this era of inclusivity, the spotlight moves, us, moves over, moves ever more in the direction of the exceptional, leaving many out. I've grown tired of conversations that only look at our exceptionalism in relation to misconceptions about us. And I've grown equally tired of conversations in which we must explain our chosen states of being, whether that be self-improving, excelling, and flexing, or slowing down, muddling through, and figuring it all out. White people aren't expected to slay all day, and when they do, they aren't asked to defend said excellence. So why should we? Yes, we slay, but black girl magic is not just in the headlines of making feats, but also in the magic of just being, unbothered, unencumbered, no questions answered except those asked of ourselves. And so I'll end there. And so um, I thought we could just start, I mean, I love an origin story. So I thought we could maybe just start by talking about the beginnings of our time as expats here in the UK and about what brought us here. Um, you know, because we're both Americans living, living here in London. Um, and then we can talk about how we connected as well. So Adele, what, what brought you here to, to London? Yeah, so you're talking about being American. It's interesting because I actually have a very complicated relationship with calling myself American. So I'm Nigerian in the sense that both my parents are Nigerian and anyone 
who has Nigerian parents know that wherever it is, if you're Nigerian, wherever whatever country you're in, the house that you grow up is Nigeria. So like whatever it is people are doing outside in your house, you're Nigerian. Um, my parents themselves immigrated to the U.S. And so I think from that experience, I always had a tenuous connection to where, I guess a tenuous connection to where I was born and, and a very strong connection to Nigeria because there's a sense that home, um, home could change, but the one constant was that you're Nigerian. I moved to London. So I've lived, I'd lived in, in London before. So after I graduated from law school, I lived in uh, London before. I'd lived in France. I lived um, in, in Amsterdam. And I'd moved back to this, we'd moved back to the States and been there for a while. And I specifically decided to move. Um, my excerpt stops before I talk about this, but we specifically decided to move when we had a son. And when I looked at my son and I heard the nurse talk about my son having a big hand, big, big hands, and I, and I, I, catapulted myself forward into the future and imagined myself um, raising a 14 or 15 or 16 year old black child um, in America, a black boy in America, and I realized I couldn't do it. Um, I didn't have the courage, I didn't have the ability um, to, to do all of the things that black parents have to do to tell their children to make themselves smaller and less than in the hope that making yourself smaller and less than uh, will make you less of a target, knowing as we give our children those instructions that it doesn't work. So that's why I left. And uh, I talk about it in my chapter when I moved, telling people, you know, when people would say, oh, why did you come? That, you know, I would have, I, there, I would have two different narratives. And this was in, uh, we moved in 2014. So I'd have these two different narratives, which were, oh, I got an amazing opportunity or we got, we wanted to live abroad. And as we got closer and closer to the election, uh, of 2016, I started being very, very honest um, about saying I moved. I moved because I can't raise black children in, in America. So that's actually how I got here. We, um, you know, I moved here a few years before you did. Um, you know, um, I moved here just before the Obamas were inaugurated. Um, so quite some time ago now, and you know, I had a job opportunity. I'd never lived abroad. You know, you uh, lived in a number of places before uh, before moving here. Whereas I grew up in Virginia and um, moved to New York after that, and had never really lived anywhere else. I, you know, I was born in Germany, but moved back to the states when I was too young to remember it. So for me, it was really an a chance, just a chance to. Uh, expand and grow and live a life elsewhere um, and just have a different experience. So it's interesting because I write about the fact that uh, race wasn't really part of the equation for me in moving abroad, although I was very aware of that tradition of Black Americans moving elsewhere as a rejection of the racism back home. Um, you know, there's a, you know, a long history of people, um, Black people during World War II, for instance, migrating, you know, or staying in Paris, you know, after the World War, because their, you know, their humanity was recognized in a way that wasn't the case here. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's so many writers, you know, James Baldwin on through to Carlene Hatcher Polite, who were inspired by, you know, the world that they saw living in France and and England. And so I, I didn't really start to think about that until I moved here. And so I think. It was after I moved here and having to sort of make my way and feeling, you know, I'd never felt so isolated as I had when I first moved here because I didn't know anyone black. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that was really a, quite an eye-opening experience for me. And it really sort of um, inspired a, a, a different understanding of my blackness and my womanhood and the intersection of those two things. Um, but, you know, I think it's interesting at Ballet because when I first met you, it, there was such, I met you and then I just wanted to hang out with you as much as possible. Like there was such a kinship there. Um, I was so thankful to meet you. And, I, and I'd love to just talk about the act of building community uh, because I think it's such a marketing buzzword right now. But to you and I, you know, it's deeply meaningful and it's a thread um, that runs throughout the book as well. Um, and you, you, you built community in a really intentional way here. So I'd love it if you could just talk about how you've done it. Yeah, so first of all, I think even the way we met speaks to what is the essence of your book. So this sisterhood, this community of Black women that spans across the diaspora. We met because I was at a, I was speaking, at, in fact, it was the first trip I had done in my new job. 
and I was speaking at a conference in Cape Town. And anyone who knows anything about Cape Town uh, will not be surprised that it was a conference about Africa, but for the whole first day, I had seen no black people speaking on the stage. And I remember being just furious and saying, how do you have a conference about Africa? And there are no black speakers, like of all places it should be this. And so I remember walking to a side panel thing and looking up and seeing who was on the stage, it was about music. And all of the speakers on the stage were again white. Why, how? But I remember looking towards the back and seeing all the way at the back, this like Brooklyn queen, you could tell from the way she looked, the way her hair was. And I was like, absolutely. So I made a beeline to where I sat next to her. And it was like a, hey girl, hey. And we started chatting because we were completely done with the, with the, uh, with the moderators who were talking about music in Africa and using Taylor Swift as an example. So we were like, we're done. So we were chatting, 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 chatting. And short of a long, so she lived in South Africa. It happened she was a Brooklyn, she's a Brooklyn queen, half Brazilian, um, but but grew up in the in New York. She was living in South Africa. We ended up chatting. I, she ended up working as a. Um, we asked her to be to work on a project, like as a partnership. I ended up hiring her onto my team. But she said you know, before that happened, she said, "Hey, I have my girl Kenya lives in London. I think you really love her." So as soon as I got back, I immediately stalked you and found you. And it was one, as soon as we met. We were like, this is tribe, like this is family. We brought our kids, we played, the, we, our, our kids played together, but even the way that we connected was very much through, it was like an underground railroad of like, hey, hang out with this person. This person can be family with you, family for you. And to your point about um, being in deliberate, I have, I've always been deliberate. I'm even more deliberate about creating community, particularly community across the diaspora. And about, and I think, and especially as, my, as our, our children have gotten older and older, the one of the things I remember that's so beautiful about being a, a black child is your parents having friends over and have their music is playing, you know, uh, Jolof is cooking, you know, Akara is cooking, and you're running around and you're just surrounded with this um, festival of blackness. And I wanted to re I wanted that to be my children's memories. So it wasn't just for me. I mean, it was very it was selfishly for me because I wanted to have girlfriends that I could kiki it up with. But it was also because I wanted to be able to create what I grew up with. So when I think of black people, when I think of blackness, I think joy. And that's what I wanted them to think of. And so I, that is why I've been quite deliberate about creating um, that community for, for myself here and also for others. And I, you know, I've loved watching it um, and I've loved being a participant in it as well, because, you know, I, you know, I've watched you build community at work um, and then we have you know, our network of girlfriends here that's been growing, you know, watching people make connections beyond the two of us, you know, even during the course of this book as well, like seeing the contributors. I mean, for those of you who don't know, the book is a collection of essays um, written by myself and then uh, also written by a group of five phenomenal women, um, including a ballet. Uh, these are women, you know, it's a diasporic group, you know, they everyone's origins are all quite different, you know. I was born in Germany, raised in Virginia. I thought I just, you know, shared her story. Jessica Horn is, you know, was born to a Ugandan mother and an American father, and raised between uh, Ghana and Fiji, I believe. Um, then we have Freddie Harrell, who is Cameroonian and grew up in the northern suburbs of Paris. Candy Carty Williams, who's Jamaican but was raised here in South London, and then Fumi Feto who is Nigerian um, and, and is British, was raised here in London. So, I mean, we all have quite different, you know, stories, but it's been beautiful to watch the friendships develop within our group as well, um, post, you know, writing and delivering this book. But I, you know, community, I, I think is also just so incredibly important because it's what allows us to create space for ourselves um, in, in, in places that aren't necessarily built for us. You know, I think about myself sort of navigating the fashion industry because, you know, that's where I've spent the majority of my professional life. And if it weren't for women like Abele and the women in, who are in our larger network, I don't think I would have been able to last as long in this industry as I have or have such a thriving career. So I think it's also just how we, you know, there's that, um, the power and the lifting as we climb. But I'm really curious, um, you know, I'd love to just talk about our initial thoughts upon moving here, because I think there's this perception of England as being post-racial. 
Um, and we live, we know that's not true, but I'd be curious to know what your expectations were when you moved here and how they might have changed in the last six years. It's funny because I've been thinking about this a lot, especially as the children get older. And as you know, um, like thinking of moving neighborhoods specifically, but I'm going in a, a weird order, but I'm specifically moving neighborhoods so that we can be neighbors so that you, me, Jessica, Fumi, all of these amazing women, so that we can walk to each other's houses. Um, and so I'm deliberately creating that and partially is, and I, I, I'm na I, I can't believe how naive I was. So I was looking out for the fact that yes, it's absolutely true that when it comes to police brutality or state sponsored, state sanctioned violence against black people in the street, that the UK, and I just wanna start by saying how appalling it is that that is something that black people have to take into consideration when we're thinking about where to live, like where will our children be killed in the street? Where will our children be allowed to thrive in school? But these are the, this is the calculus. So we don't just get to think about, oh, what are school scores or is there a yoga studio? We have to think about that. And so when I chose London, I thought, well, you know, there's a, there's a huge population of people of color, black people, but also all kinds of people. It's a quite it's quite diverse, and I'd lived in London before, but it's I, I all I would say is when I moved back, I be, I became very very surprised at the extent to which what I had taken for granted when it comes to Black community and solidarity was not present in the way I'd anticipated it to be present. So this whole thing about girl, like hey, where you see someone and you immediately form community, was something that was not happening um, as much as I would you know. It, First of all, I've seen that in the workplace, there were even less of us than there were in the States. And that that's that was also sort of a, a shift and very quite dis discombobulating to me. And whereas, so in when it comes to power in the UK, uh, in many ways, black people are in a worse position when it comes to power, when it comes to positions of authority are in a worse position in the UK. So first of all, when you go to work, you, it's not like you saw black people in the halls. And then when you saw them, they weren't checking for you. So I, I can't tell you how many times I'd be like, hey girl, hey, and you wouldn't get a hey girl, hey back. And so recognize, and there's oh, so many reasons behind it that I don't, that, you know, some of them I, that are, are, are reasons that, are, that I don't understand. And part of it is like the history of blackness in the UK is quite different from the history of blackness in, in America. You have people who are much more recent immigrants and there's a, there is a, um, uh, there, the, the African-American experience in the US is so um, totalizing in, bo in both good and bad ways because of the history of slavery and because of the continue the continued impact of slavery that there is a there is a um, a caste system that forces you and that forces you into a category but what black people have done is they've created joy around it and so it's not just oh our the thing that bonds us is oppression the thing that bonds us is joy like your favorite thing is to be able to connect with uh, with with the community of color and that is something that I found missing. Um, in the UK, not missing entirely. I absolutely did connect, and even part of our 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 circle are, are people who are from the UK um, and who have that sense. But I did have the I did my experience was that creating that community was a much harder thing and had to be much more deliberate, had to be much more intentional. And you couldn't just rock up and and be like, "Hey, girl, hey." It, it just didn't work like that. What was your experience? The same, exactly the same. So, you know, it's really interesting because I grew up, you know, you know, I'm always fascinated when we talk about our childhoods because, you know, there are quite a few similarities, but quite a few differences as well. I grew up in the American South um, where, you know, the legacy of slavery was just a constant topic of discussion as it is, as it is in most places in America. But I, um, you know, because of that, you know, we, I grew up in sort of organizations like the NAACAC. So like there were so many different, um, you know, there's a rich history of organizations and um, com organized communities that have been set up to support and bolster um, black children um, and to really kind of establish black joy at a really young age before there was that phrase black joy, you know, it, it was just, kind of woven into the um the parenting i think to just sort of um you know i think it's an extension of the you know black is beautiful movement that you know our parents uh experienced but i very much grew up with this idea of blackness as being the default and black uh, american the american concept of blackness being the default and that is 
largely, you know, joyful. It's not, you know, it's not like we were interested in proving our humanity to anyone. It was really about celebrating it. And I think there's a very sort of American sense of leading with blackness. You know, I was um, listening to a discussion and, you know, I thought it was really interesting to hear it verbalized that way, this idea of leading with your blackness as opposed to saying, you know, I'm Kenya and I happen to be black. And that's a sentiment I encountered a lot of when I first moved here. Um, and so it was, yeah, I would definitely, um, you know, I think I mentioned that I, you know, the vast majority of my working life, I've been in the fashion industry, which is overwhelmingly homogeneous. Um, and, you know, usually if I'm at a show or an event or that sort of thing, there are normally only one, two or three of us in the room in certain spaces. Um, and so when I moved here, I was quite shocked that people didn't really do the nod, um, which is, you know, such a, a basic back home. You see someone and you acknowledge one another. Um, and so I'd often be surprised when my my nod wasn't recognized and returned. And, um, you know, I very, I'll never forget this. I distinctly remember meeting someone. We were doing a panel discussion early days and she was a woman, uh, a black British woman. And, and, you know, she told me that she thought black Americans were too um, self-centered and obsessed with race and wanting to talk about race all the time. And that we, um, you know, that in her case, she was raised to just see herself as a human being first, and then, you know, as black second. And I think that's the principal difference because with us, you know, um, I just think, you know, black is such a beautiful thing. Like who wouldn't want to be black and therefore I'm happy to lead with my blackness. Um, but, you know, I think uh, that's changing as well. And that's not to say that feeling and sentiment hasn't existed in the UK either. It's just that I didn't meet it off the back. I had to look hard to find it. Um, and so I think it, it's not as omnipresent or it wasn't as omnipresent here as it is uh, back home in the States. And I think it's because the histories are different. Um, and so, yeah, I never get tired of discussing that. I, I think particularly this year when we really look at everything that's happened in the aftermath of George Floyd's very tragic, you know, killing and how, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement gaining steam this year has really inspired a whole new wave of discussion and dialogue here that probably has never really existed here in the UK to this degree. Um, you know, it's really interesting to see this real swell of black pride happening here as well um, in a way that I might not have necessarily recognized it before. But that said, you know, I, I found it to be really hard to, to make friends and to build community. So, you know, I am like, you know, forever grateful to Sherry for connecting us and um, and then I would just have to do things like just reach out to people, you know, with Funmi, you know, I read an article she'd written for Vogue and I really liked what she had to say and I felt like we should be friends. So I like sent her an email, a DM on Twitter and, you know, a cold call and we met and had tea and then um, and then we hit it off and became friends that way. So I think, yeah, it's, it can be quite awkward when you move to a new country and you have to um, build community and, and step out of your comfort zone and just, you know, do things that we might not normally thing to do in the states because we already have that community built in it's all you know it's all we've ever known yeah uh, I, would say, I would say even though we have we have the community to say i did get the sense that this so what you did in terms of just reaching out to someone which i do all the time um uh, remember when we had the so i one of the things that i'm uh and you do the same thing in terms of mentoring a mentoring group so i've created a sort of a mentoring group for young black women and I was, we were telling the story. So Kenya came uh, uh, to be a speaker and we were telling the story of how we met. And they said, so you just texted someone like out of the blue and just, and I said, yeah. And they said, oh, oh my gosh, I could never do that. Cause that would make me, I would feel like such a beg. And it's like, and what they're saying is like that you, you're someone who's begging for friendship. And I remember they said that and I was like, that is that epitomizes me like i will I, that is absolutely how i roll which is that if you see it particularly um a, a a person that you think is incredible that i have no problem saying hey yes. i'd love to have you in my life how can we connect and so I, I uh it was interesting to see them sort of realize wait that's a thing that's available to you too like if when you and that is actually how you build community you do have to be intentional about it particularly for a lot of like people who are in majority white spaces. I do, and I do think to your point, I do see um, that there are changes, especially people who are like younger in their twenties and thirties. I see them 
stepping into that and that to be in London and see that happening is a really, really exciting thing. Like people be able, being able to create community and be able to be able to step into conversations about race. And I think even some of the reactions to your book um, by a lot of young women here has been very much like, wow, we are so, your book and other books like our, our girl Efwa, like that we are now, t wait, we now have permission to talk about these things that we thought um, shouldn't be voiced. And so that's why I, I love I love the work that you're doing and I love the work that other um, writers are doing to step into this uh, conversation. Well, thank you for that. I feel the exact same way about you. I love the work you're doing. I don't know if you saw that New York Times report or uh, those who are in attendance, um, the New York Times report today about just how undiverse the book publishing industry really is. Like the numbers are really quite shocking. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think there's just, you know, this really interesting thing, there was a quote that said that the publishing world, you know, tends to uh, reawaken to the idea of blackness and that black people exist like every 10 to 15 years. Um, and, and so essentially we need to just get to a point where there's room for for more stories and that, you know, nuance, uh, we, we st you know, we see a greater variety of stories that are more nuanced. Um, you also talk about that with fashion. You talk about that with fashion as well, that we come into and out of style. So, you yeah. know, oh, we're talking about black girls now as if like during the five years when we're not in style, we just, we, we cease to exist. I mean, that, I thought that your essay on that was actually pretty interesting as well. Yeah, I mean, I think fashion is a lot like the book publishing world. You know, it's cyclical. You know, you have your incoming and outgoing trends. You know, the, the hint, oh, great. Someone's just posted the link into the chat. I highly recommend everyone click through that. I mean, it's, it's the, we should just have a whole new discussion, you know, an another hour dedicated to just that. But I mean, you know, in the fashion world, you know, they talk about an entire group of people, black people, the way that they do you know, hip skirt hemlines and silhouettes and, you know, fabrics and textiles and things. And so I think it's, um, you know, obviously, you know, there's a lot of change happening. I think this feels like more of a shift to me though, what we're seeing happening this year. Um, and I don't know if that's just me being overly optimistic, but I, you know, I, I can't really see us reverting back to that place where, where we were, you know, where we're both, um, industries were just defined by overwhelming homogeneity and no one was really saying anything about it or doing anything to to move the needle and i think that, you know social media obviously has a large part to do with that um but i'd love to talk about the experience of mothering here to um to revisit your essay that you kicked us off with um because it's been a very challenging year uh, on a number of levels but i think particularly as a parent uh mothering black boys. You have Namdi, I have Cosmo and Bruno. Um, and so, I, you know, I'd be curious to hear from you what has helped you get through this year as a mother and as a parent and maybe some of the lessons that you've learned um, in, in, in mothering Namdi through some really painful uh, moments and chapters in, uh, you know, our history. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you know obviously this is something that, that you know, and I write about it in the chapter. Um, uh there was a part of me that had um that that was and still remains enraged um that why this murder and yeah. you, so so uh, you know black people have been have been murdered in huge numbers and in my family as you know and i write about this in the book my little brother was murdered by police he was murdered by police in 2018 and so that we would be in 2020 and talking about state sponsored murder as if it was a new thing um, I, I actually found incredibly painful um, that I had had to have a conversation with, and it's interesting because I, in the, in the, in the chapter, I write about, the, about having, to how, having to balance creating a space of safety for children while also equipping them for a world that, that, um, that is unsafe for them. And for mm -hmm. a long time, I actually did not tell the children um, how their uncle had died. I, I didn't tell them, but this year, um, because of the conversations, and uh, you know, obviously they're a little bit older. This year, I did, and I, I had an anger that that's a conversation that I had to have with seven-year-olds, and a conversation that I had to have with 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 a nine-year-old to to tell them that, um, and and for them to know that it was so close. 
So it's one thing to say, this is a thing that happened far away. It's another thing entirely to say, this is a thing that happened to your uncle. And so looking at my children's faces and having them realize, no, this is not something that just can happen to someone far away. This is something that could actually happen to you um, is a horrible conversation. And so I talk about how, oh, about the, 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 this um, responsibility black parents have to create spaces of joy and create spaces of, um, uh, of safety, even though the world outside isn't. And so some of the things that we did in terms of taking the children every summer, well, I, I, we had the privilege of being able to take the, taking the children every summer to Nigeria or to Senegal or Ghana so that in the summers they could see themselves. And so in, in the summers they could see um, people who look like them, they could be affirmed. I talk about, um, I don't think I talk about this, but one of the things that, one of the things that we started, uh, uh, we were we were together on is I started sort of this um, uh, liberation school. So uh, modeled on the Black Panther Party um, liberation schools where we, we brought black children together. So we brought our kids together. We would take them on, you know, Killmonger's tour of the British Museum and talk about like, this is actually what your history is. And, and so we had little woke, well, well, children, I mean, lockdown um, kind of changed that for us, but we, we, this is work that black parents have always done. And in many ways, I mean, if you look across the diaspora, if you look across the years, this year has made, given me so much, A, respect for the work that our parents did and also for the work that our ancestors did. I mean, imagine being the parent of an enslaved person and trying to create a place of safety for a child you knew could be killed at any time or sold away from you at any time or trying to, trying to create a space of safety um, in, in an atmosphere of colonization. Um, uh, this year has made me think a lot about how much we owe our parents, how much we owe our ancestors for what they did to, to help create this space of joy, to help create this space of safety, to help us feel like we were people who deserved um, joy, who were people who deserve sort of the, the best, uh, the best things in life. Um, I, and we're, we're still working it out. I mean, in terms of what we do. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm actually curious to know how you did in particular, since um, uh, you've been in London for a lot longer period of time and your children are actually born here. And so there's a way in which they're, how, how are they shaping their identities? Who do they think of themselves as in the world? Um, and how, how are you navigating that? Yeah, I mean, it's been, you know, really difficult. I feel like I'm, yeah, I'm still figuring it out. Uh, I write in um, the epilogue to the book about how Cosmo, my eight-year-old, I walked in the room and CNN was on. And normally I try to keep the TV off, definitely the news, because it's been a heavy year. Um, and I, I, he, I don't know, somehow, anyhow, you know, he ended up watching a bit, a bit of, CNN and I walk in and he says, what if when we go home, what happens to George Floyd happens to me? And I just didn't know what to say. Like my heart just broke wide open. And I think it's because we were already feeling so raw emotionally, like such intense grief because, you know, like you've said, there've been so many uh, examples of this. I mean, we were seeing so many examples of um we were just constantly being met with footage of uh the brutaliz brutalization of black bodies you know it was quite a lot to process um and so i didn't know how to answer the question i just hugged him tight and you know just gave him you know lots of positive reinforcement as best i could and i think i um you know i talked to my parents i called my mom and dad because i grew up in virginia which is not the easiest place to live uh, i don't think the american south is the easiest place to be black now in retrospect, I realized that whereas growing up, I wasn't quite so aware of the difficulties that, um, you know, my parents would have had um, raising me with the, basically Virginia has always felt like home to me. You know, I have such an intense love for it. You know, there are people like you, Abele, who are like, I can never live in the South. I just can't do it. Um, whereas me, I love it. Like I love going home as much as possible despite the fact that, you know, it's, um, you know, it has a really dark history of terrorism essentially against, um, you know, black people and, uh, you know, that the Confederate flags are still hanging and, you know, the Trump billboards are everywhere. And I think, you know, I grew up surrounded by it and yet 
my parents had created such a safe space for me and such a joyful uh, home for me. You know, I think community was really a vital part of that in that, you know, I grew up and I felt so loved and um, so bolstered by the, the women, you know, in my family and the examples that were in my life that in a way it almost formed a shield um, and, you know, all of the examples of black excellence in my life. And so I think growing up, I never really thought about it. You know, it's just, it was just what it was. And then when I moved here and became a parent, I realized just how hard it is to foster that for your children. And, you know, Cosmo doesn't, we don't even live there. Like we're, I mean, when we, the last time we were home, we were driving to the beach and we saw a Confederate flag and he asked what that was because he'd never seen it before. And so that was also a really difficult conversation to try to explain that to him. Um, and so I just, um, yeah, I mean, I really have a whole new respect for my parents now that I'm a mother of two and I'm trying to parent my children as best I can through, you know, a lot of really intense developments um, I mean, this year has been really eye-opening for many people. And then for us, it's just kind of really, um, really deep in what we already knew. And so, yeah, I, you know, as a mother, I, I think I'm still, I don't know if I had the answers, basically. I, whenever we get together to have our dinners or our drinks or our lunches, I feel like I'm always asking you all questions, like how you're making it work because um, yeah, I'm definitely on a steep learning curve as a, you know, as a mother in general. Um, but I think, you know, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're all gonna need a little bit of therapy after this year. <laughs> and then- um, and After, how about during? During this year, for sure. Um, but I, you know, I also wanted to, to circle back to that idea of joy um, and Black Joy in particular, I mean, that liber the liberation school that you started for us and for our kids, I mean, that was such a, you know, a, a bright moment. And, you know, I'm so excited about you moving here south of the, you know, the river so that they can see each other more frequently. But I wanted to ask you, like, what are other things that spark joy for you in your life? So I, community for me is everything. And I think that's, one of the reasons I'm always building it. So our group, like our, I don't even, we actually need to figure out a name for it. So there's the stuff we do with the kids, but then our women's group, where we have a small group of like squad, um, when it's women's, it's this very small group of us people in different, um, uh, yeah, it's boss ladies, like black boss ladies, but we're all in different fields where we're kind of the onlys. Um, and and so that group brings me an incredible amount of joy. Our um, our coach, who is uh, her name is Marlon, she works primarily with women of color, and so being able to work with the coach with that group—I mean, that day that where I had we had that day-long thing, and we were all at my house, and I cooked—that brought an enormous amount of joy. Um, like I said, talking with the, this um, the group of women that I'm then my mentoring circle brings me like I just we just had our we meet I they I meet with them once a month and they meet with each other uh, uh, once a month. And yesterday night we had the meeting and I cannot tell you how much joy it was. So I always bring in guest speakers. So bringing in uh, my girl Kamala and then Kalechi, who, who's Kalechnikov on, uh, on um, Instagram and Twitter to talk, like, that kind of thing. So connecting and even, and you've heard me talk about this house, which by the way, you'll be super excited to know the mortgage finally, like that's finally, yeah. okay. yeah. we're gonna finally move to contract. Uh, <laughs> Finally, after two months, but even that is around creating a space that is about black joy, that is about community, that is about excellence. That to me, there was a, was it Regina? I can't, Regina King, where she won, I, I can't remember which award she won. And she was like, this community has always held me up. And I have that as a meme. I actually want to keep it on my phone because that is absolutely it. That's the thing that, that brings me joy. And that's the one of the things that I want. I think if everyone, particularly here in the in the UK, where I feel like there, for some people, there's this sense that, ooh, I don't, let's not talk about this black thing too much because maybe they won't notice we're black. If people could recognize how much joy there is in community, how much joy there is in solidarity. So anyway, the long and short of it is what brings me the most joy is community, solidarity, being a connector. So meeting someone and saying, oh my goodness, you're doing this, you're amazing at this. Can I connect you to this person? So, and seeing magic happen, those are the things that bring me 
enormous amounts of joy that that can that e even like days after having done it, I I uh, it lights me up. How about you? I would definitely agree with that. I mean, I have to say, you know, looking back on the year, for all of the pain that we've witnessed and experienced, I think there's been a great deal of joy as well. And that's largely because black women were the driving mechanisms of all that was good in 2020, in my view. Um, when you consider how black women rallied and organized and, and really were the driving force that put Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in office, um, when you look at how black women have been powering, you know, number one, you know, black women founded the Black Lives Matter movement, but they've also been powering it. Um, within the fashion industry, you know, a lot of the really positive changes that we're seeing happen are being driven by black women. There's so many incredible lights this year in the midst of all this darkness that have been the results of black women, but not just black women individually, but black women collectively really working together on a, on a global scale. And it's been a really beautiful thing to see. I mean, Stacey Abrams, you know, there are so many Stacey Abrams stories, I think, you know, throughout the years, a journalist, you know, as someone who has made a career of watching these moments and chronicling them and writing about them, um, you know, with the book, I, it, I when I was um, pregnant, I remember 2017 being, you know, quite a big year for black women in my view, you know, we were covering magazines um, in, in levels that we'd never seen before. And, you know, I remember newspaper headlines saying it was the Wakanda effect. You know, it was the year of black women. And, um, you know, I was really fascinated by that. And I wanted to sort of explore this period of heightened visibility for black women and what it meant for our lives on the day-to-day -day level, you know, uh, in terms of um, the sort of complications and the nuances of our lives and the experiences that I was living, but that that I was also sort of seeing, and you know, in my network of friends. And then w I wrote the book, and then 2020 happened, and that has, you know, because I I'm in the staff meetings now, where everyone, you know, we're planning our year-end stories, and everyone's like, it's the year of the black woman, you know, these sort of like sound bites and headlines, and I'm like, this is such a funny thing to hear because black women have always been doing this work. Um, it's just really. Um, funny to sort, sort of see black women getting their flowers. And that's, you know, a really beautiful thing to see black women being properly recognized for the work that we've been doing for ever since the dawn of time. But um, I think it's also about, um, you know, it's about more than that. It's about more than a headline. Um, and it's about more than a moment, you know, because this is our essentially our lived experience and it's who we are. So for me, to go back to, that was a really long-winded sort of comment, but going back to the original idea of joy, this year has been, you know, it's been a real joy for me to see what black women have accomplished and um, to see black women being recognized for, for work that we've been, you know, putting in for a very long time because black women have historically been pushed to the margins, us sort of recentering our narratives so that, you know, joy is more at the center of it rather than pain and trauma. And I see it's probably time for questions because we've gone for quite a long time. Sabir, I'll, I'll let you. I'm sorry to interrupt this. Like, thank you both so much. This conversation has been amazing. Uh, but we do have some audience questions. So to ride off of the last question, oh, who are some Black women whose work or books we should be paying attention to from Ida? And what do we, oh, we'll, well, start I, with the yeah. I, well, someone, I saw a question earlier, someone was asking about one of the writers I referenced who had moved abroad and um, was inspired by her life in France to write. Um, her name was Carlene Hatcher Polite. And she's, you know, a black woman, an incredible black woman author who, um, is not largely known. She wrote a novel called The Flagellants, which I, you know, which I love and I highly recommend. And um, it's just a kind of like um, a bit of a, like a sleeper hit. And um, it's just, you know, a beautiful um, story, a, a beautiful love story, essentially. But she's someone who moved abroad and, you know, found a new life for herself and then eventually moved back. But she's definitely someone I would recommend people get into. I mean, I I I would could recommend a million million. I will I will limit myself to just a few. So I just read "I'm Still Here" by Austin Channing Brown. 
I think it's amazing. And the last chapter, the last chapter, which is on hope, and on, specifically on the death of hope, I think is one of the most beautiful things I've read this year. I also just finished reading a book called Ordinary Light by Tracy K. Smith. Beautiful mm -hmm. book. It is an incredibly beautiful book about, um, I, it's, it's a black woman um, and she talks about sort of her story. There's n I can't convey how beautifully written it is. So just pick it up. It's, it's um, yeah, and, and she talks about her story and her relationship with her mother and sort of her evolution into womanhood. And just the writing is amazing. The writing is like poetry. Um, there's also a book, and I can't, I can't believe I can't remember the author's name, but it's about, it's called They Were Her Property. And it's specifically about the role of white women in slavery. Um, uh, uh, during anti times, mm -hmm. because often the narrative about um, slavery is that, you know, we all suffered as in like, this was something that the patriarchy did to everyone. Um, and what's interesting about it is it, it positions um, white women as participants um, in that in that system, and it, it's 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 historical. It's extremely well uh, extremely well written, incredibly well researched, and of course I have to uh, do a big up to F. War Hirsch, who was our girl, um, right. who wrote a, a book called British, which um, in the in the UK. So it's been out for a minute, but for those of us who are in the U.S. to really understand, I think it's important to understand blackness across the diaspora. And and her book we, the her book leans into this conversation about race and is very useful, particularly for those of us for, for people who don't know how it manifests um, outside of the U.S. So those are just a few. Um, but yeah, the, the, this I, um, I I love to read, and I, what I love now now that people publishers have discovered um, black people um, is that now we're getting slightly more slightly more books um, by black. Oh, also eloquent rage. I loved Eloquent Rage. Like that, I thought that book was amazing. Um, and if you haven't read um, Bell Hooks's Love Trilogy, the all, reading all, all of them sort of back to back, it, it has really re reorganized how I am thinking about love and how I'm thinking about community and how I'm thinking about the beloved community. So yeah, sorry, that was too many. No, I love that list. I'll turn it into a comment on the Facebook. Yes. People should read those books. And then, so our next question is publishing related, but a slightly darker note. It's from an anonymous viewer who says, I work in publishing at a house which is capitalizing this year by publishing books about Black grief and pain at the same time as they're publishing books which are inherently racist. As the only black person in the room, everyone sort of looks at me during our sales meetings, expecting me to say something. It's frustrating and exhausting. Do you have any advice? This is what I want to do with my life, but it's taking a toll. Girl. This is when, Girl. this is why community is so important. This is our life and our experience. I mean, Abella and I talk, this is all we talk about when we get together. Um, and so, I mean, it's exhausting doing the work because there is the labor of just doing your job. And then the, the extra layer of work of navigating all of that extra, you know, stuff. And, um, and basically just making space for, you know, marginalized people in your in your workplace and so i think that's when you really need to lean into a community of people outside of the office who can help strengthen you and give you the courage to to really say the things that need to be said um in those rooms you know at those in the you know in those conference rooms or in those zooms because we're all you know working remotely now um and and to have those difficult conversations that's certainly been the case for me you know, in the years that I've I've been working in the fashion industry, and I've I've been in that position, um, and also it's it's really hard if you're in a I don't know how where you where you are in the hierarchy or your of your company, but it's tricky when you are a junior level employee who's thrust into these positions um, because that can make you that's even more isolating and even more challenging. So yeah, it's really really important to have a network of people around you outside of work who can really help you do the work when you're at work of advocating for, for change. Yeah, I just wanted to empathize for a couple of reasons. One, I think whenever we talk about black girl magic and black women saving the world, and that shit is exhausting. Like being expected to carry the world on your back, either because you're the engine of, of slavery, producing bodies for slavery, or because you're expected to come in and save 
American de democracy, that shit is exhausting. So I just wanted to recognize that and to say that it is. Um, and the, the other thing I want to say is that everyone um, admires Stacey Abrams, Simone Sanders from afar. And so I, so what I found interesting is people uh, saying, yay, Stacey, thanks for saving us. And then watching how they treat people within their own organizations who are doing the same type of work that Stacey is doing, but they don't appreciate it when it's, when they don't appreciate when the conversation is about how they themselves are in a position um, that's upholding white supremacy or how they themselves are being problematic. And so I just wanted to honor the feeling of the person who wrote that to say, yes, it is exhausting and to support what Kenya said, the, what you're describing is my life. So, and, and anyone who's senior knows that the more senior you get, the more conversations you're in, and it can be like 20, 20, 30 a day. And you cannot do that if you don't have squad and you cannot do that if you don't have people who are supporting you. And the other thing is to the extent that there are other people in your organization who can be allies to you, other black people, other people of color, um, uh, seek them out so that you're not the only voice all of the time. Very important. Can I ask us, I'm going to pivot from the audience question to ask a slight follow-up to that one. I'm curious how you would approach, so in speaking up in those scenarios, I, feel, I get the sense that people are often labeled difficult. And like, I'd be curious to hear how you navigate, if you've had to navigate the sort of term of being called difficult. I embrace it with napalm. Hmm. As, uh, <laughs> I mean, so here's the thing. If you are someone who ever says, who at any point says, hey guys, maybe we shouldn't do that, all of a sudden you're difficult. So even no matter what tone you use, no matter if you pretty it up, like that, that is even just the fact that you have said a word and you have a black face, you're, auto, you're automatically difficult. And so I think for me, recognizing that that is something that was going to be attached to me, regardless, unless I was completely mute, um, but again, I think people can take different approaches. For me, I've leaned into it. Um, but yes, that is something that I'm called. Yeah, there's difficult, assertive, aggressive. Why you always got to talk about race? All of those things. I feel very strongly, particularly as someone who's a senior person. And I think it, it depends on where you are in the organization. I think it's my role to do that. And it's my role to speak up because other people can't. And it's also my role to, to be as uh, vocal as possible to create space um, and to create a sense of safety for other people. But I think different people, uh, you have to handle it in a way that makes sense for you. And this is why, because I know I have that, um, just not burden, because I know I have that energy coming at me at work, that's why my squads are so important and being connected to people who can sort of um, affirm me outside of work and also with, within. But Kenny, I'd be curious to know, um, because we've talked about this a lot, Yes, we have. I mean, one thing the wisdom of age has taught me is that what other people think of me is not my business. And as a result, I'm not going to, I can't really give it too much thought anymore. Although, oh, I think we lost the belly. I hope. It may no, I'm here. I just have to plug in. Oh, fine, fine. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I have definitely been called difficult before in the past. Um, or, you know, and it's, um, or, you know, I've been penalized for, you know, for saying the uncomfortable truths and, you know, in work settings and things like that. But what's really helped me is having mentors in my life who've done similar work, who have a history of it and who, you know, have the success stories and who have the wisdom and the knowledge to sort of pass on to me, to give me the perseverance and the resilience to, to, to basically to keep doing the work because um, fatigue can set in, you know, we work, we have a lot of uh, years in our working life. Um, it's, you know, it's a long time that we are, you know, working professionals, you know, working in our respective fields and industries. And so I think when you are navigating homogeneous environments as an only or one of two or one of three, uh, you can get, it's exhausting, but there reaches a point, you know, because there's a marathon. And so you, you inevitably reach that point where you're just like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I'm really tired or fear can set in or self-doubt or a different kind of imposter syndrome that can set in a bit later when you just start to second guess yourself because you're constantly in rooms where you're sometimes having a fight to get an edge in, a word in edgewise because you know there are people around you who just don't even respect you or, or can't even wrap their head around having a black woman as their boss. Or you know, there's so many different sorts of circumstances that you can find yourself in. 
And so for me personally, that's when I found having mentors in my life to be really helpful and useful. So I think there's squad in terms of like the peers that you have, but then there's squad in terms of like, you know, the elders who we can look to um, to give us, you know, advice essentially. And I think that's also, that's a carryover for my childhood as well. Um, that idea of community and, you know, having a people across a number of generations who you can look to, because I think that sense of perspective is really helpful as well. Even navigating this year, you know, I spent so much time revisiting the writing of the giants, you know, the James Baldwins, the Audre Lords, the Bell Hooks, because it really gives you a sense of perspective and really reminds us that none of this is new. You know, I think it's so interesting how, you know, when you check social media, everyone keeps referencing all of these really old works because they're so relevant. To, they're so relevant, you know? And I mean, it's, so I think that sense of perspective is healthy and to see that there are people who have fought similar battles and come out on the other side. And the reason why we're in the positions that we're in now is because of the work that they've put in. So, yeah, I mean, that's what's really kind of helped me in my own career. The other you get um, so so much pushback, you may start to doubt yourself and to say, wait, you know, am I being like, should I be leaning into this or am I wrong? And there are a couple of things that I, or be, am I, if I, because I'm getting so much pushback, is there like, there must be something to it. And so I always think one of the quotes I always have in my head is Frederick, Frederick Douglass, power gives up nothing without a fight. It never has and it never will. And so this notion of when you're getting pushback like that, keep going, you're, you know, obviously you have to make sure that you're doing self-care, you're taking care, taking care of yourself, but just because you're getting pushback doesn't mean you're wrong. And often because you're getting pushed back, that, that means you're exactly in the space that you're meant to be in. Um, but like that, that is why uh, there is absolutely nothing that of any note or value that has ever happened in the world without a fight. So if you think about any struggle, any liberation struggle, it has never been that, that people said, hey, um, we would like freedom. And people were like, you know what? You're right. We should stop colonizing. That has never been the case. And so uh, this sense that, that um, that the road will be easy, or this sense that if they're if they're really angry, then they must then I must be wrong. That so remembering and to Kenya's point, remembering ancestors and remembering uh, other struggles and real and understand and seeing the resistance they face and how much energy it took to get us to even where we are, which is nowhere we should be. That is often what gives uh, that's often what gives me courage. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. Let's see. We have a question from Shannon who asks, what's an essay in the book which surprised you, excited you, and made you laugh? Hmm. Surprise. Ooh, ooh, I have one. Okay, I, you, go first. you go first. So I loved the essay about Aretha Franklin's funeral because can we just say that was a black moment you know how you have, so there's black moments that other people join in, like, you know, Black Panther. So that was a black moment, but like other people were, you know, other people were, Aretha Franklin's funeral was like the blackest shit ever. Like, like every black person treated it like, I mean, obviously not in the sense that we were, uh, that we weren't grieving that she was gone, but there was just a sense that this was like a black Super Bowl. You had all the ministers, you had all the singers, you had like gossip, you had outfits. And so you're, your essay about that and like how everybody was like when the jokes about like how long it was gonna last and like you know you got jesse up there like, you know that you know that thing is gonna last like 12 hours how you i think you were like somewhere and then it was and then you got back home like you had a whole day I and then got Friday <laughs> like, it was still going that was very funny to me and it was very specific and it, what i loved about it also is that it was us talking to us it was the kind of thing that if you're not in us then you wouldn't like you might read it in like, like as an anthropological specimen, but you wouldn't get it the way um, the way we got it. And so I love 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 that essay. I'm glad that you enjoyed that because that one was the hardest to write. It was so long, like the funeral. So I had to keep cutting it down. So I'm like, where is this? Like I have to just end it because. It <laughs> The funeral was so long. I mean, literally, that was an entire day of my life. I'll never forget it. But I felt like my entire religious past was flashing before my eyes because I grew up, you know, deep in the Bible Belt. You know, I grew up in a Baptist church. Um, you know, I talk about how I sort of experienced the two poles of the Black religious experience because, you know, I grew up in this very glossy, upwardly mobile 
Baptist church. And then my grandmother's church was, you know, a tiny little one room, uh, room where the, you know, all the women were wearing the little white gloves and the hats and all of that. And then, you know, there's a whole, you know, whole sort of variety in between that, that space. And so, yeah, I got it all. We got it all in that, um, in that, that funeral service, that extravaganza. And it was more than just the day actually, cause there were the days leading up to it and the outfit changes and the Louboutins and, you know, it was, a, it was incredible, but you know, it sh as it should have been because queen, queen of Queens, Aretha. Um, but yeah, she <laughs> went out exactly the way she should have given who she is to, to black America. So yeah. it all, it was written. It is as it was. It written. is as it was written, with the exception of you know a few, a little few hiccups there. Um, but uh, so, but yeah. So that said, that one was um, that one was a tricky one to write. It was fun though. And then I think I um, the introduction was quite well. Actually, no. The the title essay, girl, for me was the most fun to write because I love the way that black women speak to one another. I mean, I just, you know, that I feel like love language is such a trendy phrase right now, but I mean, I really love the love language of black women. There's a, it's so melodious. And so that's one of my earliest experiences of blackness, hearing my mother and my aunt and my girlfriends speaking to one another, the intonations, um, you know, the way that we say the word girl and how it has a multitude of meanings, depending on how you're using it, who you're saying it to, you know, it can be, you know, an admonishment, it can be shade, it can be, you know, j just this joyous greeting, it can be so many things. And um, so for me, it was just really fun to to write that essay um, because I had not, I hadn't really thought about it, my use of it too much until my son, he was five at the time, started mimicking me. I hadn't even realized how much I said it. He was like, you know, every time you're on the phone with someone, it's like, girl, girl, girl. Um, and, you know, in his little five-year-old voice. And I was so taken aback because, you know, children really are like our mirror. They're so brutally honest. Um, and so that, um, you know, it was just such a giggle. And so that really <laughs> inspired me to, um, to write that essay. So, yeah, it was just a fun celebration of us. And I love that all the various phonetic spellings of the word and you know i just love what black people do with language anyway um so yeah that was the most fun for me to write i think well i am so sorry to wrap up this conversation it's been marvelous just hearing the two of you talk uh so one thank you both so much on behalf of the strand we really appreciate your time to the audience, thank you for joining us. If you haven't purchased a copy of Girl, 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 and forgive my like attempting to say that, but the purchase button is at the bottom of the screen center. On that note, I guess, uh, thank you everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, have a good night.